and Peter Goss. Thank you so much for coming through uh, to talk about this, Peter. So there's so much debate around this in Tlantlan in a situation, right? Many, some people are saying that uh, simply meeting the Guptas on its own is not problematic. Uh, you know, it's the content uh, of those meetings, which of course at this point, we really don't know what they talked about, especially given that he initially downplayed the, the, the extent to which he met with them as opposed to uh, simply just bumping into them and seeing them at, at, at various events. W where do you land on this debate? I'm sure you've had time to consider uh, the scenarios. Why what is problematic for you? What is not problematic for you? A fundamental governance principle around matters of disclosure is that you should make a full disclosure in pursuit of another element of good governance, which is transparency. What we have here is a fractional disclosure. So if we use a parallel in uh, legal terms, uh, admissibility requirements for a wrongdoing, one, admission is an admission of some elements of the wrongdoing. A confession, on the other hand, is an unequivocal admission of all elements of the wrongdoing. I believe in the case at hand, what we're missing is all elements of the wrongdoing. So we don't quite have in front of us what we call full disclosure in corporate governance, which is disclosing what happened, when it happened, with whom it happened, most importantly, why it happened, about what transaction did it happen, and what was your responsibility in relation to that transaction. So I think that the question to still answer is on all these occasions, what exactly were we discussing? What transactions were put to the minister, if indeed any were put to him? And what intervention was he expected to make? Next, did he make that intervention to progress that transaction? Or did he stand back and say, no, I cannot be involved in this transaction at all, I will not be involved, and then make a full disclosure to concerned parties. On the occasion of the Jonas uh, uh, being removed, why then at that time didn't he make, again, an equivalent disclosure about his interest and withdraw from all future engagements associated with the Gupta family? So I don't think he's been transparent with us yet. And this idea that uh, a person says, okay, I now ask to be axed, if indeed that is to be believed. Yes, that's the report. I ask myself this question, why ask to be axed? Why not resign? Mm. So the simple thing to do to show your accountability is to simply resign. But I certainly wouldn't be giving any praises for a partial admission. And I suppose this couldn't have come at a worse time for him because at the same time we've been focusing on these reports about his son and his business uh, partner uh, benefiting from the Public Investment Corporation when Tlantlanene himself was the chairperson of the PIC. Of course, some have sought to say, you know, uh, those transactions like those are handled by uh, the management of the organization. But given what we know about how uh, institutions work in South Africa, it does shine the spotlight on him, doesn't it? We're talking about the chairperson of the PIC. And for that purpose, the chairperson of the PIC should be recused from all decision making or engagements about a matter in which he may have a related party interest. So if indeed the son was involved with the PIC under whatever circumstances, it seems the argument is he was involved, he withdrew, his partner continued with the deal. If either of the um, um, situations exist, I would expect that the minister should still remove himself from the transaction, or the chairman of the PIC should remove himself, recuse himself from all decision-making associated with that particular transaction. Remove yourself, let the deputy chairperson take the seat, and consider those matters as they go forward. Because, I mean, it's not like we, we've not been here before. Remember the case of Matsila Gogo? and, and, and uh, a, a family member there in, in, at, at ESCOM uh, and the allegations there. And someone would say, I mean, if we were skeptical about Marcella Coco's explanation that this matter came up uh, casually in a conversation with my daughter, we should equally be skeptical of Ntlantan and offering the same explanation. I think we need more investigation in this matter into the circumstances of this particular admission that has been made. We need to delve further into we are saying sorry about what exactly? Because I'm getting the sense is, I'm sorry, but in the, the same apology, you get this explanation that it is normal business practice to meet business people. So I don't know w whether the apology is, I'm sorry, but well, we call that maybe an admission. We haven't yet got an unequivocal sorry, which is, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have met people. What we have is a, a sorry, I should have told you. That's what we have in my assessment. We don't want a sorry, I should have told you. We want a sorry, I have done something wrong, and these are the things I have done wrong. 
and fire me <laughs> or I resign. So I don't think it's a sorry uh, and I leave it to you to decide whether to fire me or not. I ask you to fire me. Oh, yeah. What is the context though, Peter, in, all, in which all of this is happening? I think previously when we would be talking about people meeting the Guptas and allegedly helping them out on whatever transactions and whatever they needed to get expedited in terms of government bureaucratic processes, etc., it was in a different context under the Jacob Zuma administration. What do we say now uh, with Cyril Ramaphosa, who's main message has been to say you know we're going to clean up and actually make sure we do things by the book and hold people accountable and deal with corruption and state capture what does Cyril Ramaphosa do with with the situation where it's his finance minister that is that now has these encounters with the Guptas whose full content and detail we don't know at this point this is a beautiful opportunity to show that we are moving forward along the path of institutional integrity and political integrity and the beautiful opportunity is if indeed the man himself says I'm not worthy of office and somebody being in a, senior, in a more senior position able to determine whether that person should remain in office doesn't use that opportunity to say my independent judgment of the situation based on the circumstances that prevailed which was what happened to others in relation to relationships we've got an entire state capture commission of inquiry just asking questions about relationships of people meeting in rooms of people meeting to have discussions which aren't yet corroborated by the by irregularity after discussion we have somebody here who was much more integrally involved in processes this is the chairperson of the public investment commission uh, corporation this is the chairperson of the public investment corporation this person should be held to a much higher standard more so based on the fact that this has been one of the loudest offices in the land on the issue of state capture so one has to set an example from this office about how we're going to deal with anything associated with relationships that are in, t in turn associated with state but, capture. But, but, but Peter, what about the counter argument, which I've seen certainly in the social media debate that has ensued, that says, yes, he met the Guptas, yes, he wasn't uh, upfront with us to tell us he had met the Guptas as many times as uh, he had, and to even open up about the contents of that, those meetings. But when, uh, when it came to crunch time, delivery on things such as the quote-unquote nuclear deal, he stood his ground, uh, which some are saying he should be commended for. Tulas, exonerating yourself by virtue of actions in relation to one potential wrongdoing and intervening and stopping it, not getting involved in that wrongdoing, does not mean your five other wrongdoings are all right. So I think we're really mixing up two different things. Uh, thank you very much for your work. He did his job on the nuclear deal. We wish you had done your job in the other matter and disclosed fully about the occasions on which you met a party or parties that we had various integrity concerns with. So consistency and he himself uh, stepped down and was part of a bit of a wave, a bit of a noise around being removed from office and business bandied behind uh, him in particular. So I think that you can't uh, compare the two and say one is less than the other. To me, they're all the same fruit, rotten fruit in the same basket. Because I suppose, I mean, at the end of the day, really protecting the country's fiscus against unaffordable uh, borrowing it really is the job of the finance minister, right? Absolutely. So what do you say then to those who say it would be a tragic day, Peter, uh, if... Uh, someone like Ntlantlanene were to end up being axed uh, for coming forward and, and owning up to his uh, liaisons, quote-unquote, with the Guptas, and, and people such as Matabile Tlamini remain uh, in cabinet and Malusi Gigaba remain in cabinet. You've seen that, I'm pretty sure. What do you say to that? Let the first salvo be thrown at some point in time. This is an opportunity to throw the first salvo to plant the new message from the office of the president. It's his opportunity to sow the new seeds and say to the others, we're coming after you too. New message, uh, but problems still the same uh, when it comes to governance. Let's shift focus and focus on this uh, issue of irregular expenditure. Standing now, according to the DA's collation of uh, what came out of the annual reports uh, of the various government departments and entities, at a good 72 billion rand, the DA says this has doubled from where it was uh, when they did this collation last year. 
Is there anything moving in terms of accountability for public officials who manage the finances of government? The, the uh, Auditor General laments this issue year in, year out, yet we continue to see this irregular, uh, fruitless and wasteful expenditure. It, it seems to be growing ever and ever. A few heads have to roll at some point in time. I hate the principle that accountability is about these junior officials, administrative officials that are engaged in activities of approving transactions. <coughs> what promotes that particular transaction? Somebody often promotes these irregular transactions at a political level, it seems. So what we have is a top looking at the staff and saying the top gives the staff a hiding, holds them accountable for wrongdoing such as unauthorized, irregular, and fruitless and wasteful expenditure. If we move this structure to the left slightly and had them parallel saying accountability is a two-sided coin, mm. uh, a coin which probably has two heads that are identical. So you should hold accountable the politician as much as you should hold accountable the staff member who engages in the unauthorized, irregular, and fruitless and wasteful expenditure. I think the opportunity to do this in relation to a politician has arrived. It is the beginning of an answer. That we can, it's the beginning of a new path if you want to choose it. So we should see some heads roll at a political level. Uh, should we see uh, proper prosecution of, of people, uh, you know, for instance, I, I, I don't even know if we've seen any rigorous process to hold someone accountable for violations of the Public Finance Management Act. All we see really is lamentation from time to time and, and a promise of an investigation and a promise that we are cleaning up and we all move on. I think the fundamental reason for it is the origin of these unlaw uh, unauthorized, irregular, and fruitful, and fruitful and wasteful expenditures. The origin is of a sensitive nature, and that sensitive nature tends to be a political nature. So we disguise that political nature, we therefore can't act in relation to the administrative problem. You're right, there is an offense in the Public Finance Management Act of criminal misconduct. You're right that somebody can be prosecuted in relation to these matters for criminal misconduct. We're looking forward to the day that that is done. Mm. Peter Koss, thank you so much for coming through and talking to me uh, about these matters. He is, of course, a governance expert, and we've been unpacking some of the issues that arise around the controversy into Ntlantanene, as well as the issues to do with uh, irregular expenditure uh, in various government departments. Well,